And so what does freedom look like? We're going to be talking about that this evening <clears throat> on, a, on a subject that the Holy Spirit really, really laid upon my heart days before that we're going to be teaching on that's so, so very important. Uh, some would dare say it's even controversial, but I don't believe there's anything such as controversy within the body of Christ because the word of God should settle every matter. The word of God should settle every single matter as it pertains to life in him. And so we're talking about modesty, particularly modesty of dress. And so let's get into the word of God. Before we do that, let's pray. Father God, we thank you tonight. We thank you because you're awesome. Lord God, you died on a cross so that we might receive liberty, Lord God, that we might walk in the newness of life, that we might be free, Lord God. Father God, are not just free for the sake of being free, Lord God. We are free, Lord God, so that we're not bogged down and in bondage, Lord God, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, Lord God, but that our call and our charge is to let others know that you've come to set them free. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord God, and I say use me tonight. Our prayer is to use me tonight, Lord God, as a spoon or a fork to bring food to the body that we might grow thereby, Lord God. I decrease and pray that you would increase, Lord God. Move by your spirit in each and every household, Lord God. You know what everybody needs, Lord God. <clears throat> we need a fresh word from you. We need fresh bread. Because you've said in your word, Lord God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we thank you for that word tonight in advance. We glorify you, we magnify you for meeting needs, Lord God, for healing, for breakthrough, for, for overflow, Lord God, in and, and finance, Lord God, in joy and peace, Lord God, in every single area of our lives, Lord God. We thank you tonight, Lord God. <clears throat> We glorify you. We magnify you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, we do pray. And all of God's people say, amen, amen, and amen. Modesty, 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 modesty. So <clears throat> Bible study tools are the same each week. Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Bible, Bible Dictionary, and various Bible translations. Of course, the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance is translating the Hebrew and Aramaic and the Greek. Uh, it's, our, it's our guide to, to the terminologies and the definitions uh, as they were back in the original text so that we would understand uh, what they actually mean today, because a lot of English translations don't always give us the accurate description. And that's why it's so important for us to study Matthew Hume's commentary on the Bible. That's your Bible, your study Bible on steroids, if you will, and Bible dictionary with pictures preferred, preferably, as well as uh, various Bible translations, as you'll see me use various Bible translations, but we also want to make sure that we're careful with Bible, certain Bible translations or that we're cross-referencing to make sure that they're accurate because some Bible translations do take away from the word of God. Without further ado, the first question of the night, you can unmute, we can hear you, you can type in the chat box, I will read it, but the question of the evening, first question but it's interactive Bible study is what is modesty in clothing? Bible talks about it. <laughs> what is modesty in clothing? Clothing rather. Is it important? Why or why not? What is modesty in clothing? Is it important? Part two of that question. And then if why or why not? If you think that it's important, why? If you don't think, then why not? <laughs> Anyone, if you would like to. <clears throat> hmm. 
It is important um, because I, I believe that dressing modestly uh, is is uh, one of those things that can distract people. It can um, tell a tell of who you are and what you're going for. Um, it also can uh, displease God because you're bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. So we always want to make sure that we're covered, especially women. Um, we're covered and we're not sending out the wrong message. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Let us dig into the word of God. So it's also not just in church, right? Uh, because, you know, your relationship with Jesus does not begin or end with a church service. It should be a lifestyle. And so I put up this picture. I didn't post the video. This is actually a praise and worship leader in a church. Uh, and there's a lot of people making videos as it pertains to this in the podcasting world uh, because she prances around in this outfit. Uh, and so some will say, well, wait a second. Are we supposed to police people's clothing or what? what, what what's the take on this? Um, we're going to get into the word of God because I, I don't like the, and this is a rule of thumb for us as believers, as disciples. We understand the word of God. We understand the character of God, but the ultimate authority on any given matter is always within the word of God. And so we draw our conclusions from the text of the scriptures so that we can conclude a matter and let God's word be the final say. Amen. So what does God have to say? And what are some illustrations of modesty? But first, we're going to go down a road, right? So that it can make sense to us scripturally from a standpoint of back when <clears throat> Jesus was walking around till 2024 today. What, what does it mean? So let's look in uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 26, Luke chapter 8, verse 26, Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And these are some people in church, and I just didn't pick on the women because it's more than just women. It's also men, but it's particularly women in this particular instance. Men are more visual, but it's still spiritually uh, a distraction irregardless. This is Kirk Franklin, who's, this is a gospel concert. Um, and then this is a young lady who's actually in church. And so let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. Luke chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. And they arrived at the country of Gardenias, which is over against Galilee, and went forth to land. There met him out of the city a certain man which had devils. Long time. Devils, demons, same terminology, same interchangeable definition. And where, and it spells it W-A-R-E in the King James, but it's where, like W E. A R wear no clothes. Wasn't wearing any clothes. Neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. And so here's Jesus. It's more famously quoted from uh, Mark, which we're going to go there as well. But I just want us to do some teaching tonight, right? So here's this man who's possessed with many demons. In fact, later on in the scripture, if we look at the book of Mark, Jesus asks him, what is your name? When it, from reference to he confronting this man who has the demons, and he says, legion, uh, for we are many. Uh, I can tell you that this is an actual thing. 
Uh, me and Shantae have been in, uh, on, on, on occasions where we've been uh, casting out demons out of someone and the person, we shared this testimony, but it bears repeating for the sake of tonight's Bible study. Uh, this young lady who was dressing very promiscuously uh, was basically, you know, not able to speak in any English, but however, during this casting out was speaking perfect English, the spirit speaking through her was speaking perfect English. And she said, Legion, as it pertains to the name of the demons that were possessing her, same exact thing. So <clears throat> here's this man who has a whole bunch of demons on the inside of him, devils, demons. And one of the attributes that you can tell about what's going on on the inside of the person is what they exude outwardly. So first it says that he was no clothes, naked. Why would he not have on any clothes or think that lewdness was okay? Well, demons give the person from which they are inhabiting the personality. We're going to get into that. They give them the personality. We think when you think of the terms of Jezebel's spirit, normally people think of someone who's very sensual, sexual or whatnot. But a Jezebel spirit, of course, is not just relegated to females. It also can be males because it's a spirit. It can in inhabit whoever or influence. So we get beyond that and say influence someone in a very sexual, sensual way. Right. And so here's this man who is possessed by demons, who's not wearing clothes and he's didn't he didn't neither abode in any house. So he's not in any house. He's not living in a house. He's out by the tombs, which is by graves. Right. And so let's go to Mark. So in the in the uh, Gospels, you, you typically with some some of these uh, stories, you have multiple points of view. It's like if me, you and someone went to the mall and we had a conversation at a coffee shop with someone and I asked you to 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 write about it. Well, you're going to have you're going to notice some things that maybe I didn't notice. You're maybe even though we all experience it, you may talk about some things that I didn't talk about in my account. You you might say, well, there's, you know, this person with a straw hat sitting at the table across from us. I was at the same position that you were, but I don't mention the person with the straw hat. I talk about the young lady with the pink purse. So this is what you see in the gospels. They're called synoptic gospels because they are in, they are succinct, but there are certain things that you'll see in some that you won't see in the other, although the people were right there witnessing the same event. So here's Mark's account of the same event because Mark was with Jesus as well as Luke. And it says, and then they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of Gardineris. And when he was come out of the ship, who Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs. That's that's not that's in, in, in correlation with the story of, of Luke. Uh, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. He's living out amongst the tombs. He's outside of society. So the two symptoms that we saw, the demonic activity in Luke, uh, were lewdness and or and or provo I would say and or provocative clothing, because we're going to talk about that as it pertains to modesty, and antisocial behavior. He's out by the tombs. He's a loner, someone that doesn't want to deal with society, so on and so forth. So here he is in Mark. He met him out of the tombs. The man ran to Jesus, according to the scripture. He he he, he approached Jesus, uh, and it says, out of the tombs, an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, verse three, and no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. I want us to note that uh, because number one, this these demons, superhuman strength, right? Uh, nothing works to try to curb the behavior outwardly. Notice that it says that he was bound with chains and he fetters and, you know, he plucked the chain. So he was literally off the chain. You know, we say that maybe they got that term from the Bible. I don't know, 
But that's what it means to be off the chain from a biblical sense. This man was off the chain. So, and so that, that also goes to, you know, I, I've seen people try to minister without the power of the Holy Spirit. They try to reach people or they try these help self-help things as it pertains to people and behavior. I've seen this in prisons where people say, well, if we give them these classes, if we talk to them, if we give them the right curriculum, if we allow them to sit in a circle and we have a kumbaya and without the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing's happening. Why? Because I see this right here. Here's this man that they bound with chains and the chains did not change him. Nor does anyone being incarcerated or someone being punished for anything change a person. It has to be a heart conversion. Here's this man bound with chains. He's plucking them off like they're like, like little bracelets, like what, what that is. Verse five, and always day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Now, everybody cries, right? And I'm not going to go into, because this is another study for another time. But there are certain attributes to demonic activity. Somebody that's that's just depressed all the time, they crying all the time, everything is sad. That that that's something else going on other than the fact that they're just a sad person. I'm just saying there are certain things that we need to stop. Why? Because we're the ones who are the first responders. We're the believers. When Jesus said that he wants to do things out in the earth, he wants to use you and I. But we got to be sensitive to the spirit to see what's going on and be able to diagnose so that we can help people. So a couple of more of the attributes of this demonic activity is suicidal tendencies and hurting, hurting yourself. This person is cutting himself with stones, cutting. You have people that they say they're cutters. There's, that's some, there's something spiritual behind that. That's, that's not a person that's just doesn't like themselves. They don't just harm themselves because they don't just don't like themselves or they in a moment. A lot of times that there's demonic activity behind those tendencies. And so with this man, we're going to hit, we're going to, we're going to talk about this lewd type of behavior, right? Because it says legion. So with legion, that also denotes that all of these demons don't all have the same personality. They don't all have the same uh, manifestation, right? They're not all manifesting the same thing. Uh, one of, you know, the, uh, this, he's cutting himself, he's suicidal, uh, he's crying sad all the time, he's away from people. All of these are the manifestation of demons. He's naked, another demon. We're going to focus on the one that's causing him with the lewdness, right? So let's go to Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7, starting at verse 5 in the Amplified. Proverbs chapter 7, starting at verse 5 in the Amplified. Proverbs 7, starting at verse 5 in the Amplified. Now, at the very beginning, he, you know, it's talking about sons, it's it's this is wise counsel. And so we're going to skip down to five. And here's this warning about immoral women, right? That they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the foreigner who does not observe God's laws, who flatters with smooth words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice and among the naive and inexperienced and gullible, we can underline those words, inexperienced and gullible. I saw among the youths a young man lacking good sense. Lacking good sense. Passing through the street near her corner and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black, in the in dark night. And there a woman met him. Watch this, verse 10, very key. Dressed as a prostitute and sly and cunning of heart. There has to be a style of dress 
that looks like a prostitute versus one that looks normal. Or what would be considered not, let's not even use the word normal. Let's use the word modest. Because we're going to see that in the scripture. For him to be able to denote the word of God, God himself, this is God's word, saying that this person was dressed like a prostitute. I'm able to distinguish this person dressed from everyone else. It's something different about it. It's something sensual. It's something sexual about this person's dress that makes me recognize it of being that of a prostitute. Just want to note that. Verse 11, she was boisterous and rebellious. She would not stay at home. At times, she was in the streets. At times, in the marketplace, lurking and setting her ambush at every corner, lurking and setting her ambush. What is she using? If she's dressed as a prostitute, that demon that's at work, either by possession or influence, I wanted to note that because just because, of course, we know a born again believer can't be possessed, but a born again believer can be influenced. Influenced by demonic or influenced by demons. We're going to get to examining and things of that nature and why this is important. Verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him. With a brazen and impudent face, she said to him. And then she goes on and makes her plea and, you know, come lie with me, so on and so forth. You could, you could read that whole chapter later on when you have time. So note in verse 10, there is an outward expression of demonic influence. We saw it in the scripture with the man at the tomb. One of his attributes, when he was naked. One of those legion, one of those demons were causing him to do the lewdness. The lewdness being inappropriate. He was naked. So we also need to understand that demons need a body to inhabit or influence to fulfill the desires that never go fulfilled. That's why they need more and more. You see people, you know, and we're going to see that in the scripture. They just need more and more and more. They're never satisfied. We're going to see that in the scripture. In fact, let's, let's not take my word for it. Let's go to the word of God. Go to Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12. Matthew 12. And this is in the King James. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Right? When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, watch this, I will return unto, I will return into my house. You circle that, underline that, remember that, my house. Why would a demon need a dwelling place? I just told you. This demon is not happy just roaming around without a body. He said, I'm going to return. I'm, I got to, I'm going to find somebody to inhabit. I'm going to find somebody to use. He says, I will return to my house from whence I came out. So there was a casting out of this demon, right? And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. We're going to get to that. So I know there's a question. Wait a second. Why would it just be empty? Wasn't it cast out? Yes. Verse 45. Then he goeth, then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So he's basically, listen, that's like somebody, you know, in natural sense, you know, this person whooped up on me. So I, I don't think I can win in a fair fight. I'm going to bring seven more people with me, and I guarantee you they won't whoop me this time. That's the mentality. Whatever defeated me this time is not going to defeat me again in the same manner because he says he brings seven more spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. 
And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So he, he, he thought he was off the chain to begin with. Now he, seven more come, he's worse than he was in the first beginning. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Wait a second, Pastor Jay. You said this person had demons cast a, a demon cast out of him. How is he able to then come back? Let's go to Matthew 9. Matthew 9, chapter 1. Matthew 9, chapter 1. Matthew 9, chapter 1. And he entered into the ship and passed over and came into the city. And behold, they brought him a sick, a man sick of palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of palsy, Son, be of cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, wherefore think evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know the Son of Man have power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed in the house. Let's see what I'm at here. But when he, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Jesus is teaching here without even without even having to basically spell it out. So here's this man sick of palsy, and the natural response is, well, lay hands on him so that he could be healed. But Jesus is concerned about his salvation. So the, so so what is being said here that it is possible for a person to be healed of a sickness and not be born again. It is also possible for someone to cast out a demon out of somebody and the person not receive Christ. That's why it's, that's why it's so important as we're being led by the Spirit, and this is Discipleship 101, as the Lord is leading you and you, you know, you maybe you run into that coworker, that family member, and, and God has you to speak into that person's life, and maybe it's their knee that's hurting them, or maybe, you know, they've been diagnosed with some type of some type of sickness or illness, and you pray over them. If you don't know that they're not a believer, hey, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Why? Because if you pray over their knee and their knee gets better, but then they don't receive Jesus Christ and they go to hell, what, what do we just do? We lay hands on somebody for a demon to come out. The demon comes out on the authority of the believer, right? But salvation is a personal choice. I can't cast or, or pronounce salvation over somebody. So notice how a person can have a demon cast out of them and be delivered because of the authority that we have in Christ. We're ambassadors. But if we don't get them saved, the demon comes back and see the house swept empty. Why is it swept empty? Because the Holy Spirit isn't residing. See, the Holy Spirit has to be residing in order for it to be not vacant. Demon can't come in. That's why, that's why Jesus said a divided house can't stand. Satan can't cast out Satan. Nor can a demon, because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, take residence in a truly born again believer. I say truly, not just professing. A true born again believer full of the Holy Spirit, impossible, can't happen. Won't happen. Says we're sealed to the day of redemption. So we ain't got to worry about being demonly, demon possessed. Influence, we got to be on watch for that. Got to be on watch for that. So I, I just wanted to I just wanted to denote those two things so that we can understand what's really, really going on, right? 
How did this person get seven more demons when one of the demons was cast out and roamed the earth? No, because the person wasn't born again. So it's so all very important. Hey, brother, sister, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you're back in here. I'm going to pray that this get healed. I'm going to pray that you be delivered, so on and so forth. By the way, do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you want to make that decision today? They're the ones that are going to have to confess with their mouth and believe in their hearts that the Holy Spirit can take residence in them. And that demon doesn't come back with seven more trying to inhabit and they'd be worse off than they were when you cast the first demon out. Or prayed over them for deliverance. Same thing. So in the English vernacular, right, the word perversion is the alteration of something from its original course, meaning or state to a distortion or corruption that was first intended. Notice sexual provocative dress and nakedness is preserved for a husband and wife in the bedroom. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a wife doing whatever they do inside of the bedroom. That's why the Bible says that the bed, the bedroom is undefiled, meaning there's there's no checks and balances within the confines of that bedroom between a husband and a wife. So now the enemy seeks to pervert that. The enemy is always seeking to pervert, meaning change something from its original use. This man out in the tombs. Naked, lewd. The woman we saw in Proverbs, God, God's word itself said that she was dressed like a prostitute. So there has to be something that gives us a guideline and an understanding that someone can be dressed like a prostitute or else God's word would not have said it. Let's go back to Proverbs. Let's go back to Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, 21, same chapter. We're going down in 20, verse 21, right? So it says she was, she was looking for the person that didn't have common sense. I would dare say that they, this person does not have discernment. Discernment is judgment. Discernment. 7, 21. With her much fair... Oh, no, let me go. It's just going to be the Amplified. Go back to the Amplified. With her many persuasions, she caused him to yield. The way that she was dressed, the way that she was talking. If you remember in the book of Judges, where it was talking about um, Samson and Delilah, it says that she pressed him daily. Put an O in front of that and a P, oppression. She pressed him daily. Here, it says that with her many persuasions, she caused him to yield. Yield to what? See, he think, he's thinking, and most, most people think, that when they're yielding to temptation, that they're yielding to something that is only in the natural realm. No, this originates in the spirit realm. Make no mistake about it. People are either being in, either possessed by a demon or influenced by one. And the ultimate objective is, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, is to take someone off course. So here she is. With many persuasions, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Suddenly, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Not knowing the outcome. As one in stocks going to correction. To be given to a fool. Notice what it says in verse 23. Until an arrow pierced his liver with a mortal wound. Like a bird fluttering straight into the net. He did not know what it would, that it would cost him his life. Talked about it on Sunday, opening up the window and thinking that's the only window that I'm opening up. I'm only opening up this window because I'm going to open up this window and it's just this one, this one person that I'm just, no. All of the doors get open, right?
He didn't know it was going to cost him his life. We make ourselves vulnerable. That's one of the things that the enemy is plotting and planning on us daily is to get us into these snares to make us more vulnerable and susceptible to other attacks of the enemy. Verse 26, for she has cast down many mortally wounded, indeed all who were killed by her were strong. I want you to note that these weren't no weak dudes. And I'm just not talking about dudes and as it pertains to just women, because there's some there's some men that, that do this too. Let's not get it twisted. But all of these people were be consideredly someone who was strong willed. Because there's a difference in being strong and strong in the Lord and the power of his might, Ephesians 6 and 10. So these were people who were supposed to be strong. Right? Evil is driving and influencing the behavior. Still talking about modesty. Still talking about modesty of dress. Still talking about the body of Christ. Still talking about what the Lord says is modesty and why it's important. Why, 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 why? First Peter. First Peter. Chapter three, verse three through five. Your adornment. This is an amplified as well. Your adornment must not be merely external with the interweaving and elaborate knotting of the hair and wearing gold jewelry or being superficially preoccupied with dressing in expensive clothes. But let it be the inner beauty, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit. This is this is this is wife training 101. Gentle, peaceful spirit. Not the uh -uh, I can't believe you just I'm a I'm a bush in your mouth. You better not come in this house no two minutes late. All this kind of stuff. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. This is one example. I'm just one that is calm, calm spirit, not jacked up all the time, not not just. All over the place, emotional. We got, we got, we got to be able to be controlled by the spirit. Calm and self-controlled, not over anxious, fretting and worry about everything. But serene and spiritually mature. Oh, that's spiritually mature. Which is a very, which is very precious in the sight of God. Notice what it says, verse five. For in this way, in former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands and adapting themselves to them. Notice she adapts herself to him. Daps herself to him. That's what a helper is. If, if it's a helper, if someone hires me to be a dental assistant and they're a dentist, I walk into the office. I need to be able to adapt to the person for which I am designed to help, not the other way around. Imagine me as a helper coming into the dental office. The person who I'm supposed to be helping it to now nah, you're doing this all right. I ain't going to do it like that. And I've been doing it because I grew up like this and I don't care about you, what you're saying. I would. No, 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 no. Time out. Not about what you're like and this is how I am and all. No, all of that goes out of the window. According to the word of God. Now We can go on social media and you can find 55 different podcasters that will tell you eight different ways to be successful in a relationship. But you want God's blueprint? You're, un you're unsubscribed to all of those and go right to the word of God where it says, I need to adapt to him. Proverbs 18, 22 says, this is in the Amplified, no, this is in the King James.
Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtain a favor of the Lord. Wait a second. You find a wife, then that must mean she's already married. What you're doing, that's adultery. No, 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 no. She has to be made to be what it was talking about in 1 Peter 3, 3 through, 3 through 5 in order for the husband to find her. There's no amount of makeup. There's no amount of perfume. There's no amount of hair getting done that's going to cause the godly husband that he would have for you to notice you other than going through the true process of being spiritually mature. That's the process. We can go to the gym. That's great. We can go get clothes, hair, nails, all that stuff. But none of that, according to the word of God, is going to help a husband find the wife. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtain a favor of the Lord. Must be a wife before you are the wife. There's no such thing as dressing like a single woman to be noticed. You're never single because the Bible says that you're married to Christ. So if she's already a wife, then everything in 1 Peter 3 through 5 is including modesty of dress needs to be adhered to. If you have to dress revealing in order to be revealed to your husband, that's not your husband. I met my wife, Shantae. She had, a, she had a, a skirt down to her ankles. Nothing tight, nothing, none of that. And I still saw her for who she was. And got a revelation that she was my wife. She didn't have to come dressed in, in, in tight booty shorts, none of that stuff. She didn't have to do none of that stuff. She didn't have to pack on the makeup, put her a, put a hair up. In she didn't have to do none of that because it was a spiritual revelation. Nothing wrong with any of those things. I didn't have to put on a muscle shirt in order for her to see me and say, oh, oh that's, that's got to be, not that she had to be revealed, not that I had to be revealed to her anyway. That would have been backwards. She was revealed to me. I chose her. I saw her and said, I found my good thing. But she was dressed modestly. So that said something to me about her in the spirit realm about the type of person she was in Christ. Sending out signals all the time. Sending out messaging all the time. So, is this topic off limits when discipling others? Why or why not? We'll get more into the study. You can type in the chat box. You can unmute. We can hear. Is this topic off limits when discipling others? Why? Why not? I know somebody has the answer. Unmute. <laughs> Hello? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, I read the thing, but I don't know what topic is it. <laughs> it is off uh, the limit. Mod stuff. Modesty and dress. As we're discipling other women, particularly in men, is that a topic that's off the off, that should be off limits when discipling someone? Oh, no, that has to be in there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, sister. Thank you. All right. So let's look at the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Gospel of John, chapter 16, starting at 7 in the Amplified. John 16, 7 in the Amplified. Oh, not in John. That was. Luke, John 16, 7. Talking about the Holy Spirit, right? And it says, but I tell you the truth. 
it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. So now here's the Holy Spirit. This is for people, born again believers. This is when the Bible says we are to examine ourselves, whether we're in the faith, testing, test the spirit by the spirit. What's the test? The, the, the answer key is the word of God. So now I have to have a conscience of these things. If I don't have a conscience, then I need to question and examine myself as to why I don't. Conscious meaning I should be able to look at my, look in my mirror before anyone else says something to me and the Holy Spirit who's on the inside of me, who's my counselor, is providing me counsel. Holy Spirit on the inside of me should be saying, mm -mm. don't put that on. No, you need to. No, that's not. Mm -mm. It's not. No, don't wear that. Too tight to this, do that. Because number one, he's the helper, right? He's, he's here to help me. He's here to help me. Comforter, intercessor, he's my counselor. Nothing against Christian counseling, right? Because we do need other people. God uses people, by the way, to counsel us. That's why it's called discipleship. There's other people who decide. We're going to get into that in a minute in the, in the word of God. We may go over it a little bit, but this is good. This is fine. And as far as time, he's the counselor. So now I can it, I, I can't say that I'm without counsel. So Shantae shared this testimony several times before because it's important to note. It's it's we use this as a teaching tool about the young lady, one of the young ladies that came to the church and said something, you know, came in with you know the tight shorts on, everything like that, sat down and basically sat across from Shantae and confessed that, you know. Uh, she had worn these shorts for me. But one of the things that she said while she was sitting there, and there were other ladies that came in, it was kind of like they would come in, scope out the place, they would come in, and I could, I could, I had discernment, so I could immediately tell sometimes, well, why would she wear that? You know, I mean, super, I mean, like super revealing. Uh, they would come in through drive through prayer, and then they would, you know, visit the church, they would peek around, okay, he's okay. Not only is he married, but he looks like him and his wife have a great relationship. I'll see y'all later. I'm not coming back. And so, but one of the things that the young lady said to Shantae was that she thought that she was hearing from God. Now, wait a second. How, how does a person think that they're hearing from God and, he tell, and God tell them, put on a tank top with your chest poked all out, put on some really, really short shorts. And come up to the Christian school slash church so that you can prance around for the pastor who's married. Not even the pastor who's married, just anybody. Come out the house, period, because God is not relegated to a church. People say, well, oh, that's the church. You know, I could wear my hot girl pants when I go. No, we should be because God is everywhere, right? Think about Jesus in your dressing room with you. Think about Jesus in your closet with you. Think about Jesus sitting on your bed while you're getting dressed and the thoughts that go through your mind while you're putting on what you're putting on. Would it be okay to express those same thoughts to Jesus and say, this is why I'm putting this on because I want to make sure that it pop and this, that, and, and all of this other kind of stuff. I'll come outside the same way. I'll, I got on the, 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 the tank top and I'm coming out to preach because I want to make sure that, you know, what is the focus on? So I have this Holy Spirit on the inside of me, the person of the Holy Spirit, by which I talked about a couple of weeks ago, can be grieved. And that's why we're grieved. So if I'm in this intimate relationship with him, he's going to convict me of when I'm coloring outside of the lines. He should. And he does. So how do I miss it? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 second corinthians chapter 10 in the amplified starting at verse 
3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Our warfare is not with people that we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. Are not, it's not in the natural room. It's not with the five senses, right? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. For some people, this is a stronghold. Been doing it so long. I'm, I, I just don't even, you know, uh, I, actually, it's not, I don't think they don't know that it, they just don't care. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. Here we are right here, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? Does this thought that I'm having about what it is that I'm wearing line up with the word of God? Because if it doesn't, then I need to cast it down. So there's this thought, Holy Spirit comes in, he's a gentleman, he's a whisperer, right? It's not screaming in our ears, says to us, mm, or says to us through somebody else. Holy Spirit will speak to us through somebody else. But what we do sometimes, we get offended because of the person who's telling us about our style of dress or what we're wearing. We get offended. Casting down imaginations is Holy Spirit says something, but but I look good in this though. I want I want I want some attention. I want somebody to notice me. I want you know I want to be attractive to the opposite sex. But that's not what the Word of God tells us when it tells us to be modest. It says that the revealing is going to come spiritually. That's not to say that we're wearing winter coats in the winter. I'm not talking about that. That's that's over excessive to the one to one end and the other. But we should have a guide, a point of reference on the inside of us by way of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to look at this in the word of God, where there are other people who are more who are mature in the word of God, who should be able to help us in this area. Why is that important? Let's look at Romans. Let's look at Romans. Chapter 14, starting at verse 10, Romans 13, 14, starting at verse 10 in the Amplified, Romans 14, starting at verse 10 in the Amplified. Why do you criticize your brother? Or again, why do you look down on the on your believing brother or regard him with content? For we will stand before the judgment seat of, no, that's not the scripture. Hmm. Holy Spirit, help me. By the way, this chapter is talking about when someone, the, the, the difference between someone desiring to eat meat that was given and to sacrifice someone that's not desiring to eat meat. It's talking about being critical in that sense. But definitely we are to be able to help someone in the area of being holy. This is not. Hmm. The scripture that I'm referring to, Holy Spirit will have to bring it to me later. And if not, it's talking about someone being a, someone causing someone to be a stumbling block, someone causing someone to stumble, someone causing someone to sin by way of their actions. And so, Romans 14, 3. Okay, I wrote it down wrong. Romans 14, 3. Excuse me. I'm going to read this in the Amplified. The one who eats everything is not to look down on the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat must not criticize or pass judgment on the one who eats everything, for God has accepted him. Mm. Oh, that's not it either. It's fine. Layman's terms, we don't want to be a we don't want to allow the devil to pimp us to be someone else's temptation. 
We don't want to be pimped by the enemy to be the reason why someone else falls or stumbles or causes them to fall or stumble. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is in the Amplified. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 in the Amplified. But the Holy Spirit explicitly explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times, some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead, instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. Misled by the hypocrisy of liars whose conscious, consciences are seared as branded as, let me check. Romans 14, 13. Okay, let me go back. Got some help here tonight. Keep your thought processes there. Romans 14, 13. Yes, that is it. I don't know why I wrote down 14, 10, but it's Romans 14, 13. Let us not criticize one another anymore, but rather determine this not to put an obstacle or stumbling block or a source of temptation in another believer's way. Thank you, my help me. So I don't want to be a stumbling block or a source of temptation in another believer's way. How do I do that? Well, we saw in Proverbs how the person was dressed like a prostitute. Obviously, there was a distinction to where she was luring this person. So. Same thing goes for, for guys. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Holy Spirit speaking this explicitly and unmistakably and declares in latter times, some will turn away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. Seductive spirits taking you away, taking your focus away. Misled by the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared as with branding with a branding iron, leaving them incapable of ethical functioning. People who just they don't this I don't I don't know I didn't know that I was doing that I don't how did I, I do I I am I do dress like that no I can't I'm talking about somebody that's a believer. And even those who are not believers in the church, yes, they, the people say, well, you want to you wanna catch the fist before you clean them up. But at some given point in time, when that, new, when that new person visits the church in love, we need to help people to come to Christ. We need to help people to understand what holiness is so that they're not a distraction or they're not causing someone to sin, right? And you might say, well, the person who doesn't know, how can that be if they're born? How, how could they be if they're born again? They're going to have to examine for themselves. I have to be able to examine myself. I definitely don't want to fall into the category of someone that has my conscience seared with a hot iron. That means I have no sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. That means I could do whatever, say whatever, dress however, and it doesn't bother me. That's what it means to have someone's conscience seared with a hot iron. That Think about someone who doesn't have nerve endings. They could put their hand on a hot stove and it not bother them, not realizing the inherent danger or the damage that is being done to them. Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through four. Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through four. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right. And even when it is not, keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether it convenient or inconvenient, or welcome or unwelcome, correct those who are in error, who err in doctrine or behavior. Doctrine or be, dress is a behavior. The Bible says that we are to correct them in love. Correct those who are in error in doctrine or behavior. Warn those who sin. 
exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity. So at the same point that we're helping them to grow as they grow, also exhort and encourage. Man, brother, you're doing wonderful. Hey, sister, wow, awesome transformation. I see what God is doing in your life. But we're not, not to, to neglect our responsibility. With inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching, for the time will come, that day is 2024, where people will not tolerate sound doctrine with accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. They won't tolerate sound doctrine. Some people, you, you roll up on them and they like, listen, I'm going to wear what I want to wear because I want to wear it and I don't care. He shouldn't be looking anyway. That's I've, I've heard that before. He shouldn't be looking anyway. What he got, he need to be focusing on the word. He, uh, or even outside of the church. I buy, I buy my clothes. I don't care what you, okay, but do you belong to you or do you belong to Christ? For the time will come, verse three, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and an accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. People don't like to be challenged with God's truth. The flesh doesn't like to be challenged with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing. Please don't tell me that uh, I've been doing this and, 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 it, and this, I'm not supposed to because I like doing what I'm doing, basically. They will accumulate for themselves many teachers. One after the other, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support their er the errors they hold. They'll search YouTube, Instagram. They'll find any old teaching. They'll find fit. They'll find whatever it is that they can find. Somebody that lines up. You go out searching for a message that lines up with your ideology outside of the Word of God. You'll find it. Just go to social media. They're all out there. They heap to themselves teachers and so many people, they looking at that stuff and they, they toss to and fro. Go to 50 churches just to find the one person that agree with them on the error that they hold. Notice it says to support the errors they hold, not, <coughs> not to confront them with the truth. I just want to get in front of somebody that's going to support the errors I hold because I don't want to change. So I need somebody that challenges and shocks my conscience if I'm in this situation. Romans 1, verse 24. Romans 1, verse 24. Romans 1, verse 24. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. And what do I mean by that? This is not something that just started happening in the 21st century. There are prostitutes in the temple in, in, the, in, in Jesus's day, there are people who dress provocatively. There are people who are, who are luring. There are people who did all of these types of evil because guess what? Demons don't age. So these same spirits that were walking around then and enticing people to, to develop a community like Sodom and Gomorrah and all this immoral activity. It's not that the world is getting less and less, you know, or the world is getting worse and worse. No, it's just that the world, the world is actually listening, listening less and less to God. Think about that. Same demons were around 2,000 years ago. How is it that society as a whole, just within the past 100 years, has gone down this sexually perverted path? Well, you think about it. My mom, my, mo my grandmother's generation, they were all going to church. My grandmother's generation... They wore slips underneath their dresses. They, they didn't wear certain things because there was taught in the church. There was discipleship going on. There were certain things that you just weren't comfortable with because the community around you had a center of focus on God and it was not acceptable. And they loved you enough to tell you, no, baby, that's not acceptable. You wouldn't even think about wearing or dressing some of the things that they dress and wear today. No, wouldn't. The Bible says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard. The standard is us, the body of Christ. But one of the things that the enemy has taught the body of Christ is shut your mouth, don't say nothing. That's her business. 
Mama don't say nothing because you know she bought it. Devil is a lie. Even when I had a job, <laughs> everything still ran through. And even outside of the house, now the Holy Spirit is the one that should govern me. Holy Spirit is the one that should guide me. So let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 24. This is the danger in having a conscience seared with a hot iron to where there's no sensitivity to the Spirit in my modesty, in my dress, in my style of what I'm doing, right? Where, therefore, God gave them over in the, the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity. Who gave them over? God gave them over. In the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. I'm just going to give you over. That's how you want to dress. That's how you want to act. That's how you want to be. Verse 25, because by choice, they changed the truth of God for a lie. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. How do you, how do you worship the creature before you worship the creator? I put myself on the throne. I say it's about what I like. It's about what I'm going to do. I only got one life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear it. I, he gave me this body. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to look the way I want to look. I want to look because I want to look in this, that, because it's me, 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 me. It's a narcissistic type of Christianity. It's about me. It's not about what God says. And it's even not about what God says through people warning me. I just, I look at the messenger and I shoot the messenger. Well, I, I don't see nothing wrong with it. You're the only one who see that. Okay, okay, okay. God says, I'll stop talking to you through that person and I'll give you over to destruction. Because that's what happens. Notice what it says in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vile passions. Where their women exchange a natural function that is which, that which is unnatural a function contrary to nature and the same also the same way also the men turned away from the natural function of a woman and were consumed with their desire toward one another this is not just going about sex this is not just talking about homosexuality which it is but this is also can be heterosexuality where the person pushes out the voice of God and says, I'm just going to do this for me. I'm just going to do this for man. I'm just going to do this because I want the attention. I'm just going to do this because it feels good to me. I don't see nothing wrong with it. Men with men committing shameful acts in return, receiving their own bodies, the inevitable and inappropriate penalty for their wrongdoing. And since they did not see fit in see fit to acknowledge God or consider him raw worth, excuse me, knowing as their creator, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Another translation, reprobate, depraved mind. You're wondering how some people could live in this way and do this and not have any conscience. There ain't nothing wrong. And it's that nothing. It's just the culture. And it's just the way that it is. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So why am I conforming to a world that God told me not to? God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are improper and repulsive. That's why they can be comfortable in doing it. This is an examination of ourselves. If I'm comfortable in doing this, if it's okay with me and I'm just comfortable and my closet look like hoochie mama uh, or, 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 or my, my closet look like whatever you could call a man, a male a whoremonger, that I'm just trying to just flex and, and do all of this stuff and be a stumbling block to somebody, then I need to ask myself, I need to examine myself. Lord, have I gotten so far away from hearing your voice that I don't see these things? Verse 29, until they were filled, permeated, saturated with every kind of unrighteous wickedness, greed, evil, 
full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and mean-spiritedness. The, they are gossip, spreading rumors, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of new forms of evil. <laughs> Come up with some stuff. Disobedient and disrespectful to parents. A lot of these demons manifest themselves in different ways, right? Amazing how this person started out with this one sin and then all of this stuff came behind it. That's what we're talking about. But God is having us to exercise spiritual warfare and guard ourselves against these things. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, without pity, although they know God's righteous decree and his judgment that those who do such things deserve death, yet they not only do them, but they even enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. So in other words, these are people that don't know that it's wrong, but they've been given over to a depraved mind and they understand that these things are they're worthy of death. They not only do them, but they enthusiastically approve of others that do it and they tolerate it. Tolerate means we don't say anything. Tolerate means we got to love people enough to be able to help people. So where does, where does it say that in the word of God as far as the New Testament? Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 1. This is the, this is the, the charge of the church and discipleship, right? Titus chapter 2, verse 1, King James. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. What I was just talking about is sound doctrine. The modesty of dress is sound doctrine. These are the conversations we need to be having with women. It's not just about older women, young women. It's talking about mature women in the faith, mature men in the faith. Somebody sag and I got to be able to tell, hey, man, pull your pants up. That's lewd and lascivious. That age men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The age women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Teachers. Teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. That's a ministry. Discerning, got to teach young women how to discern. You should have known what you looked like before you stepped out of the house. Discern. You should have known that that was going to be something that would be enticing. You got to discern. Lovers to love their husbands and to love children. Teach them how to love a husband before they get one. To be discreet. Chase or chast, keepers of keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know how the word of God is blasphemed? The word of God is blasphemed. The word of God is blasphemed when people say, see that I told you, and she says she a Christian. Look at her. She got her cheeks hanging out of her. Look, uh, mm -hmm, them Christians be the main one. Uh -huh, girl. Look at that, what she got on talking about some. She saved and she holy. Mm -hmm, that's how she got. Mm -hmm. So in order to teach this, you have to be this first, though. You got to be the example. So it's no different than me telling somebody I'm trying to take, I'm trying to teach somebody to not smoke and I'm puffing 15 uh, cigarettes a day. That's not going to work. I'm trying to get somebody from being an alcoholic and I'm trying to bring them to Christ, but I'm toting up Tim, Tim back to buy. Yeah, man, because you know that drinking, man. That drinking ain't no good, you know what I'm saying? Or I got on the, the, the short shorts, but I'm telling her, now, see, because you don't need to be dressing like that because you know, because no, it's not going to work. Teaching is by example. So last scripture, Mark, Mark chapter five. Verse 15, notice what happened after the demons left. This is to let you know that there's demonic activity. So now here's Jesus. You remember the, the demoniac man we started out with? He was living in the tombs. He was cutting himself. He was sad. He was crying. He, he was naked, lewd, all of these things. Jesus cast out the demon. Verse 15, Mark 5, verse 15, King James. 
demonic activity left, right? Whether by influence, I'm, in this sense, he cast out the demon he was possessed. Some people need deliverance. Mark chapter 5, verse 15. Mark chapter 5, verse 15. Actually, I got to go to one more scripture after, before, after that. Mark chapter 5, verse 15. And they came to Jesus. And they, oh, excuse me. And they come to Jesus and see that, see him that was possessed with the devil. So after Jesus had cast out the demon, here comes the testimony. This is why people need to see your testimony. It's not about your genesis. It's not how about how you start. It's not about how you might have been dressing last week or last month. They need to see the transformation. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and, and had the legion sitting and clothed. He was naked, now he's clothed. She was wearing hoochie mama shorts, but now she's dressing modest. And in his right mind, and they were afraid. That's what a testimony will do. We got to love people enough to be able to tell them the truth. He was clothed. Something we know it was a demon because before he was naked and he was cool. Before she was she was dressing the way he was, he, or he was dressing the way that he was dressing. He was cool with it. It was okay. There was nothing wrong. That I, I ain't nothing wrong with how I look. This is normal to me. But after he was delivered, he was clothed and in his right mind. So that lets you know that sometimes people are not even in their right mind. Functioning. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. This is what we got to get to, too. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all churches of the saints. Is ever there confusion? That's what it talks about. You know, the person, they, they heap it to themselves, teachers, they're looking for answers over here, looking up. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. So if we're ever confused about something, we need to question where the confusion is coming from. It's not God. Need to be settled on the word of God. We need to be settled on certain issues so that we can be able to teach people. And this is something that is huge. Huge. Within the body of Christ. This thing called modesty. We're the example to the world. We're the example. There needs to be, there, there, there used to be we, we, we call it the generation, the, the, the village, but the village needs to come back. The village comes back with God being at the center. The mature women teaching these young ladies how to dress. No, you don't need to look like you're going to the gym and you're not going to the gym. Why Why you? No. Walking out the house like that. No, stop. Why you? Why? No. Somebody need to love Kirk Franklin enough to talk to Kirk Franklin. Care where you at? Where you doing a concert at? Care you on the carnival cruise or wherever? We're representing Christ no matter where we are. We're ambassadors for Christ. Modesty is at the heart of God. Modesty, 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 and let the Holy Spirit be the God. Hello, family. This is Pastor Jay with Hope for Today Ministries, and I pray that today's message has been a blessing to you. For ways to give, uh, if you look on the screen, we have our cash app, which is dollar sign Hope for Today Ministries. Uh, we also have our website, Hope for Today Ministries. Also, uh, my website, johnnybrenham.org, where you can find all of our ministry uh, workings and ways to give. And finally, there's a unique way to give by simply joining our shopping club. Uh, you join the shopping club and it has over 400 products. Every time that you shop for uh, items that you would already buy at your local grocery store or uh, shopping center, 
uh, will go towards our ministries. We have over 400 products in this shopping club from everything from soap, uh, coffee, tea, vitamins, snacks for the home, all healthy, all things that are going to help improve your health and also be a blessing uh, to our ministry and the work that we're doing. I do pray that we see you on the next video. Uh, until then, may the Lord bless and keep you. God bless.